Thank you, Dave. And before I start, just want to say a big thank you to all the people who uh, have given such positive feedback from last week. And last week we started to look at the gift or manifestation of prophecy. We looked at the truth that we all, in different ways, hear God, that we can all bring a prophetic word in the context of a, of a service or any other time we are gathered together. I would also add that these can come when we are dealing with people who are not Christians, as God speaks key to unlock their situation or heart. We looked at what prophecy is for, edification, exhortation, and encouragement, and the different ways people can see the manifestation of prophecy work through their lives and ministries. We also touched upon the fact that there are those who are called to be prophets. This is where I want to start this week. Then I want to look briefly at the concept of waging warfare according to a prophetic word or prophetic or prophetic warfare, along with a few other concepts and to put some boundaries for the use of prophecy, both when we um, um, use of prophecy when we meet together. Before I start, I want to quickly share a couple of ways God speaks to me. One is that a line or two of a song starts repeating in my head like an old record that has been scratched and keeps jumping back to the same place. I have learned to stop, think about the words of the song, and then ask God what he wants to say through them. The other way is that a question or statement appears in my thoughts. As I explore the question or statement, then a prophetic word comes. This is how nearly every word I have shared in a church prayer meeting or at the annual church meal has come. You will have the way God speaks to you. You may not realise it is God, but as you explore it, you will start to recognise how God speaks to you in a way, in a language that is yours. Moving on to the office of prophet, in 1 Corinthians 12, 28 and 29, Paul speaks of those who have been appointed prophets. He also speaks of these in for Ephesians 4.11, where he states that Christ gave some to be apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers and evangelists. Both these passages have something important to say, a truth we need to hear. It is Christ who appoints people as prophets. It is him who gives them to the church. You do not decide that you are a prophet, apostle or any other of the offices. Just because you prophesy does not mean you cannot claim you are a prophet. People kept asking me for years whether I was a prophet and the answer was the same, no. Why? Because God had not spoken to me that I was in the office of prophet. If people ask me now, I can say yes. Why? Earlier this year, I had a dream. As dreams and visions are not the usual way God speaks to me, when I get one that I remember, I take notice. In the dream, I was at a conference where we had been split into small discussion groups. These groups were co-led by two recognized prophets. The group I was in was led by someone who I've never met and have only tenuous links with his ministry, who would be seen as the grandfather within the prophetic movement and someone whose ministry and someone whose ministry I have stronger links with, including a relationship with the ministry's prayer leader, who is a father of the prophetic movement. The first man comes, man comes from a Pentecostal background and I have never heard him speak. The other is, a is from a charismatic background, including time involved with Vineyard. In the dream, the older man turned to me and asked what I thought about what we were discussing. The second man then laughed and stated, you are one of the keenest prophets of your generation, keenest as in sharp. I asked a number of people to test the dream, but without stating the context of, of what the dream was. I just told people that I had a dream which I needed confirmation that it was from God. The reason I didn't share the context of the dream was because I didn't want to lead people. All the people who were asked responded with the affirmation that the dream was from God and that I had to accept what was said about me in the dream. I then searched out footage of the older man on YouTube 
and discovered the voice I heard in the dream was the man's voice. I was reluctant to share this because I don't, do not want to be part of what a lady called Johnny Amos in her book, The Definitive Guide to the Prophetic, describes as a title wave of people claiming the title of Office of Prophet. But I'm sharing this to use myself as an example in the rest of the sermon. So, what is a prophet? Despite having been involved with the prophetic movement for, ne for nearly 30 years, I'm not sure. Emma Stark of Glasgow Prophetic Centre and the convener of the British Isles Council of the Prophets and Global Prophetic Network says that while we have had the restoration of the title of the Office of Prophet, we have not had the restoration of the role of the prophet. I agree. Being a prophet is not about what you say from the front, the message you bring. Abraham is the first person called a prophet in scripture, yet there is no record of him bringing a prophetic word to someone. Why was Abraham called a prophet then? Because he walked in an intimate relationship. He was a friend of God to the point where God was willing to share his plans with Abraham. Our, author our authority, whatever our gift, comes not from the accuracy of what we say of the num or the number of times we are seen exercising our gift in public. Our authority comes from the depth of our relationship with God. The deeper our level of intimacy, the greater our level of authority. In their classic book, The Elijah Task by John and Paula Sanford, they state that a prophet would rather spend time in intimate prayer with God than to stand on stage. I and everyone I have talked to who is in the office of prophet agrees. A prophet is not what you do, it is who you are. Many authors such as the Sanfords, James Gold, Cindy Jacobs and Chris Volaton state that it takes from being called to be a prophet to being appointed as a prophet um, a, more than 20 years. During this time, your DNA is changed. Prophet is written into your DNA. Like a caterpillar who has been remolded into a butterfly, you have been changed. This is not a, pre a pleasant process, but the cost is worth it. I wrote this last, the next sentence before uh, Dave brought his word a couple of weeks ago about being in a cocoon. And the word chrysalis, the cocoon where the transformation takes place, comes from the Greek word for gold. This is appropriate as the process is that of gold being refined. This image is given in Malachi 3, along with God's presence being like a launderer's soap. This type of soap is very caustic and will take your skin off. The process is not nice, it is not pleasant, but it is necessary. So, what has changed by my stepping into the office of prophet? On some levels, not much. I am still under the authority of the elders in Jubilee. My being in the office of prophet does not trump the authority of Dave, John, John, Sean, Rick or Nathan. In her book, The Prophet's Handbook, Dr. Paula Price states, the prophet's authority is largely set by the pastor. The prophet's authority in a church, pastor's church is strictly influential as delegated by the pastor. Church prophet limits, largely set by the pastor, are subject to his or her revocation at any time. The prophet is under the authority of the elder, who has the spiritual, emotional, and even the physical care of those in the church. The term pastor, as many elders are called, comes from the Latin pastum, meaning to feed. The word prophet comes from the, from the Greek phrase to speak for. Yes, a pastor can be prophetic, and a prophet, as seen in Samuel and Moses, 
can be pastoral, but both are needed for saints to be equipped. It also means that I can't go to Hope Church in Aldershot or any other church, deliver a prophetic word and disappear. Even in the prophetic networks I'm involved in, I am subject to the authority of those who lead the networks. The same is true for the independent work I do outside of these networks concerning the prophetic, where there are advisory councils to hold me accountable. There is not, and there should never be room for the attitude, I'm a prophet, as an excuse not to be accountable. If I go to another town or city to minister, I am accountable to those who invited me and who live minister in that community. Any word I give must be tested as every prophetic word should be. Yes, they can have more weight and authority, but they are still bad coal. The daughter of the word concept we talked, I talked about last week. They still do not have the weight and authority of scripture. The basis of the words must still be to encourage, to exhort, to edify. They can bring warning, they can bring discipline, they can even judge on occasions, but they cannot be words of doom. The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus, Revelation 19, 9-10. The Lord disciplines the ones he loves, Proverbs 3, 12, and um, quoted in Hebrews 12, 6. But even to the church, oops, sorry, um, find my page. Even to the churches of Sardis and Laodicea, Jesus calls them to a restored relationship, to a higher place. Jesus calls these prophets, these churches, to get their house in order. He warns of judgment, but calls them back to His love. True prophecy will do the same. I also have the task, the obligation to equip others. This is not the only job description given for prophets as well as apostles, teachers, pastors and evangelists in the New Testament. Oops, sorry, that is, it, this is the only job description given in the New Testament to equip saints, believers for works of service. Notice the reasons, the reason of these works, of the equipping, to build up, to edify the church. Everything else is built on these two foundations of intimacy and equipping others. Being a prophet also means that I cannot stand up at any time and interrupt the service to give a word. 1 Corinthians 4, 14, 32 states that the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. In ancient Greek and Roman cultures, there were temples with oracles who would be possessed by a spirit and then would give a word of divination. This tainted the, mini the ministry of the Holy Spirit at Corinth as people acted as the oracles did. The Holy Spirit does not mug you. It does not possess you. The example of trances in the Bible are not found in times of corporate worship, but in quiet times. A good example is Peter with the vision of the unclean food. Even those who write about ecstatic prophecy and visions, such as Stacey Campbell and Jonathan Welton, teach that these are in partnership with the Spirit. You may have noticed that I don't actually stand up much to bring a prophetic word. There are reasons for this. One is that I prefer the place of intimacy to the platform. The second is that I want others to hear from God. Yes, I'm a prophet, but I do not have the monopoly of hearing God and bringing words. As we as I emphasised at the start and talked about last week, everyone at Jubilee can hear God. You are your own best prophet, as some people have put it. Everyone can bring a word. I would rather sit on my chair so that others can step up than hug the mic and make people feel inadequate. Even the words brought at the annual church dinner, I have shared because I've been asked to. When I've said to the leadership, I think 
I think this is, if they think it is a word, they can read it out. I also want to be the focus, I also want the focus to be on the one whose testimony a prophecy is. A prophet is a, mes is a messenger for God, and a true prophet will want to focus on the one who sent the message, not on the messenger. But it takes maturity to step into the shadows so that Jesus may shine more brightly. I want to quote Bob Hazlitt, a leader in the prophetic movement in the USA on this. What he says is in the context to the death of US Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg last week, but is sadly too true a phenomena on social media. What he wrote was, this is not a political post. This is a post about prophetic character. Ruth Bader Ginsburg paved the way for many women behind her. She was a pioneer. I disagreed with her policies, but as a dad of two daughters, I celebrate, celebrate her purpose. The prophet Samuel wept when Saul was rejected. David mourned when Saul died. I opened my feed today to several prophets claim celebrating themselves over the prediction of her death. I am grieved by the character of prophets who would, before her body is laid to rest, publicly post, publicly post their prophecies of her death. Every day I read posts from people declaring it is their time for their voice to arise. I celebrate emo emerging voices, but I challenge you to emerge with the spirit of prophecy, which is the testimony of Jesus. Take a moment to reflect on his character. Jesus never celebrated the death of an adversary. Instead, he wept over a city that missed its moment. In this moment of history, we do not need more prophets. We need mature prophets. That is what we should aspire to be and to raise up. I want to quickly look at two things before I move on to the subject of testing prophetic words. This is what the difference, one is what the difference between a seer and a prophet is, and also to look at the strange concept I mentioned last week of prophesying through the playing of musical instruments. Firstly, what is a seer? The answer is in the name, someone who sees. There are two words for seer in Hebrew, rahe, meaning to see, to gain insight, and chaza, meaning to a visionary or stargazer, someone who sees visions. The word for prophet in Hebrew is nabi, meaning a spokesperson, someone who brings forth words, one called to speak for him. Not all prophetically gifted are seers. Not everyone who has the gift of prophecy will see um, visions, have dreams, but all true seers must be involved with the prophetic. Three people named as seers in scripture are Asaph, um, He-Man and Jeduson. They are actually called the king seers. They are listed together in 1 Chronicle, Chronicles 25, 1, where it says that David set them to prophesy with lyres, lutes, and cymbals. The Hebrew is interesting. As this word prophesy with can mean they sang their prophetic words accompanied by the instrument, um, while they were playing the instrument, or it can mean that playing the musical instrument is how they prophesied. Quite literally that Asaph, who is the second most prolific author of Psalms after David, He-Man and Jeduthun and their sons who served with them did not sing, but brought heaven to earth through the playing of their musical instruments. That is seers, they saw and heard the music in heaven and copied it on earth. Somehow linking not just seers with the 
with seeing things, but actually with hearing and much more. I have heard someone do this once, but I but believe as God desires to raise up the tabernacle of David, as Mary, I, Dave and others have spoken words on, so this anointing must be rediscovered. John Wimber told the story that he started singing the song, Isn't It Beautiful? And thinking it was a wonderful song, he wrote it down and used it in worship. A number of years later, Wimber had a vision and heard the angel singing, Isn't He Beautiful? And remarked to an angel how great it was to hear the angel singing his worship song. The angels replied, no, it wasn't Wimber's song. The angels had been singing it for aeons, for, for eons, and that they had lent it to Wimber. May we have more songs like that. Okay, moving on, both this week, last week and this week, I have mentioned testing prophetic words. In both 1 Corinthians 14 and 1 Thessalonians 5, we are commanded to test prophetic words. 1 Thessalonians 5.20 tells us not to treat prophecies with contempt. The Greek here suggests that the way we hold prophecies in contempt is not to test them. John tells his readers in his first letter to test the spirits, but the context of this is the rise of false prophets. So the suggestion being that it, this is about testing the words these people bring. How then do we test prophecies? Firstly, we hold them up to the Bible. A prophetic word I bring is subject to the Bible, not the other way around. If anyone brings a prophetic word that contradicts the Bible, it is to be rejected. Secondly, we hold them up to the light of the world. Remember, true prophecy is the testimony of Jesus, so it will honour God. Then we have the criteria of 1 Corinthians 14. Does the word edify, exhort and encourage? Finally, is it spoken with love? We can all do this and I'm encouraged to do so in 1 Corinthians 14. Digging deeper is for your prayer time or for the leaders of the church ministry, church or ministry. But just as people check paper money to see whether it is legitimate, so we need to do these checks with a prophetic word. This, this testing is important as is, where possible, recording the words in some way. The reason is these prophetic words can be used as weapons of spiritual warfare. Ephesians 6, 17, part of the list of the armour of God, tells us to take the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Hebrews 4, 12 tells us that the word of the Lord is sharper than a two-edged sword. Yes, this refers to the written word, our Bible, but we can apply this to a prophetic word. Paul encourages Timothy in his first letter to wage warfare according to the prophetic word that has been given to him. A prophetic word speaks into a situation, gives God's heart for that situation. It can then be used as a sword to declare the truth and life over someone or something or, or something. An example is the song today by Brian Dawson, writer of songs such as Come Now is the Time to Worship, Refiner's Fire and many others. The refrain of today says, today I choose to follow you, today I choose to give my yes to you, today I choose to hear your voice and live, today I choose to follow you. The chorus then states, lifted straight from just Joshua 24, 15. As for me and my house, we will serve you. As for me and my house, we will spend our lives on you. This is a sword to be used in warfare for the prodigal, especially if there has been a word that they would serve the Lord in some way. It is a de declaration to the enemy that however dark the situation, however far a prodigal seems to be from the Lord, 
however deep the rebellion seems to be, that the Lord will prevail. That um, quote from Timothy is 1 Timothy 18. Paul tell, telling Timothy to that by following the prophecies once spoken over him, by recalling, he can fight the spiritual battle well. We've had a number of prophecies in this church about prodigals returning. For some people, it is time to pull out those prophetic words and use them to fight. This takes me on to the difficult issue of words that do not come to pass. Sadly, the lives of too many people, too many churches, too many cities and nations are littered with prophetic words that have not come to pass. Why is this? Firstly, they may not have been prophetic words. They may have come from the human spirit, not the Holy Spirit. It is possible for a prophetic, prophetically gifted person to pick up the desires of your heart and speak them over you as a prophecy when it is not. Related to this is the fact that over the last few years, there has been a phenomena of politically correct prophecies. I mean, by this I mean words that fitted people's political worldviews. This happened over Brexit, the midterm elections in the USA, and other situations. Many failed to come true as they were reflecting what people wanted to hear politically rather than what God was saying. There are also the politically correct prophecies of the hyper grace movement were mentioning sin and calling for repentance, warning people of spiritual attack, or speaking anything but fluffy rose tinted love leads to the word being rejected. Many prophetic words have fallen to the ground and have been unfulfilled because they do not reflect the spirit of prophecy. They do not declare the testimony of Jesus. Julian Adams, director of Frequency Ministries, a prophetic ministry endorsed by Terry Virgo, as well as the national leaders of Vineyard in the UK, says the following. The world needs a clear expression of prophetic ministry now more than ever. When prophetic ministry deviates from the clarity of scripture concerning how we are to interact with culture, politics, religion and the kingdom of God, we get into trouble. The prophetic was never meant to confirm or affirm conspiracies, political parties or the conscience led Christian. We must return to a clear understanding of the kingdom where our allegiance is to King Jesus and his ever increasing government of grace, mercy, justice for the poor and marginalized, supernatural power and all things being made new. The only rights we have in this kingdom is to live in the ways of Jesus. Secondly, it could be that the meaning of, or the timing was not interpreted correctly. Go back a couple of slides, Dave. Um, you, Graham Cook, who used to be involved with the Prophetic Network, before moving to the USA, tells us someone who received a prophetic word where a visiting speaker saw him on a beach with a metal detector. The visitor interpreted the word as meaning the person was called to detect the schemes of the enemy. But after prayer, it was realized that the person was called to detect the metal, the spirit, the courage of a person. He was called to search out the treasure in a person. The original interpretation went against the character of the person prophesied over made him and the church leadership more comfortable and led to some unneeded spiritual warfare. The fresh interpretation was witnessed not only in people's spirits, but, the fact, but in the fact that it quickly bore fruit. The vision was correct, the interpretation was not. Thirdly, it could be that we were complacent and did not war enough. Earlier this year, a number of high profile prophetic voices stated that the Lord had shown them that the COVID-19 pandemic would, be, would end on Passover. This has not come to pass. Could it be that the words, as so many words are, 
was conditional, needing us to push into the Lord in prayer. But instead we took it as read that the words would come to pass. When Elisha was on his deathbed, he called King Joash to visit him. One of the things Elisha told Joash to do was to take arrows and hit them against the ground. Joash did, but stopped after the third time, when he should have carried on until the arrows broke. Did we pray, but stopped too soon? To finish, how do we give a word? Where possible, write it down, tape it. This allows you and the person you give it to process and pray into. When I receive a word about 99% of the time, it is only when I go back to the word that I realize it's from God and not my imagination. You would think after however many years, I would know it, but I still have to go back to check. Secondly, do not sex up a prophetic word. Do not claim to have a dream as an example when it wasn't a dream, just to make it look more special. Unless you are in the office of the prophet, avoid prophesying marriage, death, babies, and similar issues. Even those who have the authority of a prophet avoid prophesying these things. Submit your authority you're covering. Use words and phrases that are easy to understand. God is not a God of confusion. He is a God of order. So prophetic words must not leave people confused as to what was said. This does not mean we cannot use imagery, but it does mean we need to explain things. Track the word. In the reasons for a word not coming to pass, I haven't mentioned lack of faith. Why? Because this is rarely the issue. People have the faith to see a word come to pass, but may not have prayed enough, were warred enough. If the word does not come to pass, why? If you reflected the desires of someone's heart, what you said, what people wanted to hear, then the prophecy does didn't come to pass. Was the reason the prophecy didn't come to pass was because you misspoke. If you put the wrong interpretation on a word, this is not the fault of the one you gave the prophecy to. It was your. You need to deal with it. Yes, you will not be a hundred percent accurate in the words that do come true. Agabus wasn't. But if the fault is at your end, then you have the responsibility to deal with the harm done. If a person or church was complacent, then help them work through how to war, how to pray with the prophetic word. Okay. This has been a whistle stop tool. Stop look at the, the gift manifestation of the prophetic prophecy. As I said at the start of last week, this topic could take a whole term. And I have barely mentioned words of knowledge, words of wisdom and discernment, as these are covered in the next few weeks. Hopefully I have answered some of the questions people have and encouraged you to step out. If so, welcome to the adventure that is the prophet, the prophetic. But before I hand over to Dave, I just want to pray. Um, Father, as we come now, as we are together, I ask you to release your spirit of prophecy afresh onto Jubilee and those watching, whether they are watching live or they are watching it recorded. I declare now dreams for those who have been asking for dreams. For those with words of knowledge, I declare a fresh accuracy with those words. For those with words of wisdom, 
a greater authority and anointing. I declare open ears and open eyes in the spirit. And for those who have a prophetic creativity to play through worship, to write songs, to write poetry, draw paintings, I speak now a freedom from restrictions, a freedom from fear that they would step out and, and move more freely in the gifting that you have given them. I pray this knowing that you hear and you love to answer. In Jesus' name, amen.